on this episode of China Unscripted. The Chinese Communist Party is waging war by taking advantage of American corporate greed, and it's putting all of our lives at risk. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Mike Bowen, co-owner of Prestige Ameritech, a medical supply company. Mike, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So, you know, on, on this show, we've all been talking about how bad it was that the Chinese Communist Party has been controlling the global medical supply chain. Uh, so it's great to talk to somebody who has been talking about that for 15 years, even before the show began. <laughs> yeah, um, it's something that you know, I just know my little piece of it. You know, uh, we're involved in masks and respirators. And in about 2004, the, all of America's major mask and respirator makers left the country. And we decided to start a mask company in the interest of national security. We saw a vacuum and we were very naive. We started a, We started telling the story basically that hasn't changed for 15 years. And that's that China is going to end up controlling the U.S. mask supply. A pandemic will come probably from that region of the world and uh, America's mask supply will be cut off. And uh, for 15 years, I couldn't get it. Well, for 13 years, I couldn't get anyone to believe me for about the last year and a half they have. So, Well, I don't know, considering uh, where we are right now uh, and how China is going right back to making most of the masks and American mask manufacturers are at risk of getting shut down again. I think no one still believes you, even after the pandemic. I mean, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, a global pandemic coming from China, China controlling all of our masks. I mean, who would believe that, right? Uh, it's it's uh, it's surreal. The whole thing is so, so weird. In 2007, I thought it was so obvious. I thought, again, we were naive. I thought if I notify hospitals and notify the government that all of the U.S. mask makers have left and China is gaining control of the mask supply, that's a big problem. It's a national security, national security problem, but I couldn't get anyone. I mean, literally, I couldn't get news people, uh, politicians, hospital administrators, a group purchasing organization. Heck, I even went to the <laughs> I went to the, the hospital risk managers association meeting, and I said the mask supply is going to collapse, and you're going to get sued because you can't protect your your people, your your staff, and your patients. And you're going to get sued because I've been out here saying this for 10 years publicly. And they yawned. I mean, I couldn't get anyone to listen. It was, it was, I felt like the only sane person in the asylum. Um, <laughs> literally, yeah. Well, so what was the reaction? Was it just disbelief or was it, oh, well, this won't be a problem? Uh, apathy, disbelief. Um, and I'm the only one here's problem. The problem is I was the only one saying this, the mm. only one in my industry saying this, which is insane. And so all of my competitors who, who, who relied on selling foreign made masks were, you know, were dismissing my, uh, warnings. Now, here's another problem. If a hospital looks at their masks boxes, they can't tell where they're, where they come from. The mask market leader marks their boxes product of USA further processed in Mexico. It's it's attorney speak for we send some fabric to Mexico that completely make the mask in Mexico. And I, I even reported this to the Federal Trade Commission and they said it's legal. And I said, that's ridiculous. It's like sending a roll of sheet metal to Mexico, totally making a Ford F-150 pickup truck, sending it back here and put product of USA on it. It's a uh, that kind of stuff needs to stop because if right now all of America's hospitals decided to buy American, they wouldn't know if they bought American or not. And, and 95, there's a 95 percent chance they're not buying American. So back in 2004, why did all the American mass manufacturers move over to China? What was the appeal? It's pretty simple. Uh, hospitals don't just independently buy products. They all belong to buying groups. This happened about 30 years ago. They all joined these giant buying groups and they bid out the products. Like they'll say, okay, now we're bidding out masks for 2000 hospitals and the low bidder wins. Well, 
doesn't take long to figure out who the low bidder is going to be. It's going to be Asia. And that's why uh, so many, so many of our critically important medical products, masks, respirators, drugs, all sorts of things come from China. It's all about the money. And that's that's the real problem with this, because the Chinese Communist Party, it's, you know, they it's a state controlled economy. They understand having control over the global medical supply chain is really important for them. So they are able to put out to flood the market with uh, well, it's basically dumping medical supplies that thing. They, they make things below the market cost so they can drive out any competition and gain total control. That that is what we're seeing. Um, they sell masks for a penny. Literally a penny. A penny. Yeah. Imagine that. Making a mask, shipping it here, selling it for a penny. That is impossible. The nose wire, just the, the, the bendable nose wire across the top of the mask costs more than a penny. It costs more than a penny to ship it here. The fabric costs more than a penny. An American-made mask, you can buy three of them for the price of a gumball. It's a dime. Is that a big deal? No, it didn't used to be. Masks cost less than they did 30 years ago, folks. American-made masks cost, you can buy three for the price of a gumball. And uh, yet uh, China um, sells them for a penny. And I I guess they must be being subsidized by the government because no businessman is no business person is stupid enough to sell a product for a penny. It costs them a nickel or seven cents to make. And I think that really shows the intention of the Chinese Communist Party with this. It's not about making money. It's not about doing business. It's about unrestricted warfare. They want this control. You know, I'm not a politician. I'm about as uh, politically incorrect as they come. But it sure looks like that to me. I mean, we we're 15 years old, and we don't we do not have an international business. Why? Because China's given away the product. It's everywhere. Um, uh, something interesting that happened uh, 10 or 12 years ago is France realized this problem, and they uh, the French government put out a bid for like I don't know a billion masks or something, which started a couple of French mask makers. Because they said we're dependent on China, um, but I couldn't get our government to to understand that or to react to it. Now, one thing that's interesting is uh, Congressman Michael Burgess. Look him up. He was speaking at our factory. You can look. You can find it on the internet. Look at, on, on YouTube. Look up Michael Burgess and Prestige Ameritech. After the last pandemic, I convinced him and the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, who was most recently the energy secretary, to come and speak at our grand opening. After a pandemic, because we're going to protect Americans. Ironically, 11 years later, he's co-chairing the subcommittee that I'm testifying before uh, last May, um, saying what the hell happened. And I'm saying, hey, you were there 10 years ago. You, uh, I tried to get you to help me, you know. So, I mean, I, I listen, folks, there was not a rock that I left unturned on this issue. It was my mission and obsession for 15 years. So tell us a little bit about who you approached in the U.S. government. You know, did what the response was? Did you did you manage to talk to people in the in the federal government, uh, you know, in the executive branch? I talked with the DOD, the VA, um, Congressman Joe Barton, uh, Congresswoman Kay Granger, um, Senator Patrick Leahy, uh, an associate of mine, spoke with uh, Schumer. Um, General Mattis, I wrote General Mattis. I wrote the President Obama, President Bush, President Trump multiple times. Um, I, um, the the only responsive agency that I found was a division of of HHS called BARDA, B-A-R-D-A. They're the folks who fund uh, new countermeasures for pandemics and things. The first director of that was a man named uh, Robin Robinson. The second director was an interim director, Richard Hatchett, and the third was Rick Bright. And you'll maybe remember Rick Bright was involved in the whistleblower uh, case in which I testified. All three of those fine public servants said, Mike, you are right. We're not allowed to talk to reporters about this 
we agree with you. If you can get hospitals and hospital group purchasing organizations to call us, we will verify that we think the mask supply is going to fail. Here's the shame. I couldn't get anyone to make the call. They didn't want to know. It's all about money. It's all about saving money, not saving lives. The message of the mass supply is going to collapse and your, your patients and your staff are going to get sick and it doesn't have to happen. We're talking about pennies here. They don't want to hear that message. Hospitals want to save money. Gosh, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking about like all of the rhetoric behind like, oh, you know, how important, uh, you know, it is to go on to, to go into lockdowns, how important all the vaccination efforts are. And yet the government wasn't willing to spend pennies to save lives with masks. Well, the government and hospitals and hospital group purchasing organizations, everybody in the whole chain. And I want you to think about something here. <clears throat> the people in the hospitals that I have access to, they're incentivized to save money. The people in the group purchasing organizations are incentivized to save money. When a guy comes in and says, your mass supply is going to collapse, your people are going to get sick and die for no reason, I could fix that problem. It's like I'm speaking a different language. Their eyes glaze over. And uh, again, I couldn't get them to make the call. I said, Here, here's a 202 area code. Here's HHS in Washington, D.C. This is a high government official. Robin Robinson, his pay grade, he's like an admiral. Call this guy. He will verify that your supply is going to collapse. Now, I can say this. A couple of people did. Uh, World famous MD Anderson Cancer Center. They've been a patient. They've been a patient. <laughs> they've been a, a uh, customer of mine for several years. They believed it. They actually, uh, Robinson actually got on a plane and went and spoke to a group of people down in Houston, not selling masks, of course, but just saying, "Hey, this is going to be a problem." This was several years ago. MD Anderson um, said, "We believe you," and they switched. Um, only one other big hospital system did, and that's Texas Health Resources in Texas. They have about 30 hospitals. And by the way, they were the, they were the hospital that had the Ebola patient. So I've been protecting those guys for, for a long time. But by and large, people just didn't believe it or didn't want to believe it. Was that also the problem in the government is the money issue? I don't know what the problem was in the government. Um, I used to be really altruistic. And I... I thought that the folks in the government were were really smart and were really up on stuff. So that's why at the beginning at the beginning of this, I thought all I got all I've got to do is bring this up. But it, it didn't work that way. I'll tell you how bad it was. In 2006, we started talking about this. In November of 2007, HHS came to us, visited our factory. I've got their presentation that they gave us. And uh, they said, we think the mass supply is going to fail in a pandemic. And we said, yeah, we've been saying that for a year. Um, we're so excited you're down here. Let's fix this problem. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. I, we're only authorized to study the problem. And I said, <laughs> oh, God. I, I, I'm not kidding. We're only authorized to study the problem. So... Uh, so since then, since November of 2007, I latched on to those guys like a leech because they were the only government agency, even though they said they couldn't fix it, didn't have the authorization to fix it, they could verify it. Uh, I mean, because otherwise, I'm just a mask salesman out telling people the mask supply is going to collapse. I'm the only one doing it. So why are people going to believe? Why will people believe me? So I kept thinking again, I kept thinking, hey, these people, Believe me, they're an important government agency. They will verify what I'm saying is true. And yet I couldn't get people to listen to them. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever saw the, the old uh, Warner Brothers cartoon about the guy who finds a singing frog. And he, he finds this frog in, in the cornerstone of a building they're tearing down and it starts singing Broadway tunes. And every time he he tr he, he he rents a big hall and, and has the frog out and it's going to sing. And the problem is the frog only sings when it's with him alone. That was HHS for 13 years. They were my singing frog. They would sing to me. I could call them. I could email them. They'd say, yes, the mask supply is going to collapse. And I'd say, well, here, Infection Control Today wants to interview you. I'm oh, sorry, I can't. 
uh, Robin Robinson was going to endorse the Secure Mask Supply Association. Look up securemasksupply.org. I have not changed that since 2014. That thing has existed since 2014. He was going to endorse it, and HHS attorneys said he would get fired if he did. So I'm out there twisting in the wind on my own for 13 years um, uh, with it, with HHS saying, you go, you know, hey, keep going, keep telling the story, it's through. But I couldn't get them to publicly uh, endorse it. So about 10 years ago, uh, there was the big scare over the swine flu. Yeah. And that was, you know, fortunately, it did not become the kind of global pandemic we had in 2020, 2021. But what happened then? Because that should have been a pretty big wake up call, right? Yeah, you'd think uh, you can go back and look at a Lou Dobbs CNN um, uh, story that's on YouTube that, that I did 10, 11 years ago. Uh, my business partner was on Neil Cavuto with Fox News, and it's all the same stuff, just what's happening now. Everybody say, how did this happen? Why are we unprepared? Boy, we better fix this now. And when it was over, everybody went back to the same thing. We we ended up uh, firing 150 people that helped save a lot of hospitals. We had to raise a million dollars to stay in business. We, we came right to the brink of going out of business because everybody went back to their Chinese and uh, Mexican-made products. And let me say this. Even now, hospitals and GPOs are saying, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna buy some American products, but you know we we've got to, you know we have budgets and we're gonna keep buying about eighty percent uh, Chinese masks." Oh my God! Well, so so give oh, us. Yeah, it's it's that bad. It's that bad. Yeah. So like, that sounds crazy. But on the other hand, like, are they saving a substantial amount of money? Because I mean, like. How much how much does a hospital save, like a typical hospital save in their annual budget buying Chinese masks versus American masks? Uh, I, I don't know that off the top of my head, but listen to this. Um, as you know, as everybody knows right now, billions of dollars of masks have been bought dur- in the USA during this crisis. The governor of California spent a billion dollars with three dollar um, uh, N95s. Wait, sorry, sorry, three dollars for an N95. Three dollars. He bought a billion dollars worth of Chinese N95s for three dollars a piece when I was selling them for seventy nine cents. Um, okay, here's here's the deal. Billions of dollars of masks have been bought this year in the last eighteen months. The whole damn market is a hundred and fifty million dollars during peacetime. One fifty. So what's the savings on that? Let's just say that. My products cost 30%, 40% less. Okay, what's that, $50 million? The whole damn problem for $50 million? It, 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 this is, it's awful. This is, a, this is a tragedy. This happened for pennies. 6,000 hospitals, $50 million divided by into 6,000 hospitals. We're not talking about a lot of money. Um, I have said many times that America's hospitals and and group purchasing organizations, cost savings to them is like crack cocaine. It it, it trumps everything else. And they will they will risk their patients' lives and 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 maybe not look that way and try to try to not think this is gonna happen and try to pretend that they're they're making good decisions because they're they're reducing the price of health care. But it's all bullshit. They're they're endangering their patients to save pennies. They're chasing pennies to China, and they're putting their patients and their staff and Americans at risk to save pennies. You know, you you sell masks, but I got to say, right now you're making me pretty sick. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, and part of the problem here too. Think about it. What am I? When you boil it down, I'm a ma- I'm a business owner, but I'm a mask salesman. So people will look at me and go, hey, nobody else is saying this. Um, you know, you're going to make some profit. I even had a reporter six months ago say, do you ever feel guilty about profiting off the misery of others? And I said, I said, well, does your cancer surgeon feel guilty about saving your life by removing your cancer? Hell no, I don't feel guilty. You know, we've, we've crawled, my company, my business partner and I, have crawled through a lot of broken glass. Um, 
uh, it's been damn hard. Um, 15 years to get to $10 million in sales, almost going out of business, always trying to do the right thing and, and being ignored. And you say, okay, well, why did you do that? Why, why did you tell a story that nobody believed? Imagine it. Imagine a salesperson telling the same story for 13 years that nobody, nobody believes. It's the only story I had. And it was real. And it was true. And I knew people were going to die. I couldn't stop. It was an obsession. I, I sent thousands of emails. I talked to everybody I could talk to. I was on the news countless times. And what would happen every time a flu would happen, uh, a local camera crew would come out and say, so are you selling a lot of masks? And I'd say, yeah, but that's not the story, folks. The story is the mask supply is going to collapse. Americans are going to die. And, and then and then we get a president who makes fun of the pandemic, calls it a hoax, uh, makes fun of masks, makes fun of people who wear masks. I mean, this whole, the whole thing was crazy, and it continues to be crazy. We've got people out now. I saw a news story last night. There's people, that some state somewhere is setting up secret vaccinations so people can get vaccinated and their friends won't know, so their friends won't make fun of them. I mean, this is this is like a, a bad movie. I, 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 I totally don't understand it. I don't understand the whole thing. It's sickening. Well, I, I, I just like your whole your whole speech about how like these, you know, hospitals are putting people's lives at risk for pennies. Like that just, this just makes me think like, oh, like all the talk about socialized medicine, like... What would that really look like? It seems like it'd just be more the same kind of bureaucratic saving money over people's lives. I don't know. I, I, I'm not qualified to answer that question. I'm just out here trying to uh, trying to stay in business and and trying to survive. By the way, you know, the, the last year and a half has been our business has been way up, of course, but it's starting to go down now. And all of the new mask makers, uh, there's probably 50 of them. They're all going to go out of business. All of them. When you say new mask makers, you mean American manufacturers. American, yeah, American manufacturers that started up during the pandemic, either to make money or because they had a patriotic um, feeling. Uh, I think there's some, there were some of both. They're all going to go out of business. There's the, the peacetime market won't support them. Uh, they have substandard products. Their products cost too much, even even against you know American made masks. And uh, the government is not planning on buying lots and lots of masks to to make them survive. The government also has told me, and I, I talked to the White House, they are not going to, they, uh, our government doesn't have the either the authority or the guts to ban Chinese masks. So now they're talking about the possibility of maybe subsidies or the possibility of tariffs, but I don't know. Um, you know, I, I said a minute ago that I started out as an as altruist, and now my feeling now is I don't want to know about our nuclear program. If our health care, if the folks in charge of our health care are this bad, I don't even want to know about the folks in charge of nukes. I didn't, I never thought about that, but now I will think about that every <laughs> night I go to sleep. <laughs> I mean, I had the, uh, the head of the national stockpile, a guy named Greg Burrell. Um, tell me face to face, right three feet away from me, that he didn't bother him that China controlled our mask supply. Really? Because five six years ago, man, because it's cheaper, and we're oh. saving money. Okay. But yeah. What, what, boggles, again, what boggles me about the money is like you said that it would only cost fifty million dollars a year to buy made in America, divided among six thousand hospitals, right? Yeah. So that's yep. that's like eight eight or nine thousand dollars a year per hospital, which is like less than the cost of one surgery. You know, like I, it's it's such an insanely tiny amount of money compared to the tens of millions of dollars that are flowing through hospitals every year that like I just I can't even comprehend why they would even bother trying to save that amount of and money. versus the the risk of having a authoritarian communist country that is at war with the united states have that kind of leverage over us right and then on top of that like in 2020 remember those those protests with like nurses and other healthcare workers who were like you know protesting the lack of ppe mm -hmm. right and i remember that being all over the news last year you'd think that they would try to do something it gets worse oh good right now yeah yeah uh, I'm drowning in, in 95s. My warehouse is full of them. So are my competitors. And guess what? Hospitals 
some hospitals are still making their healthcare heroes, which, by the way, it doesn't cost anything to call somebody a hero, but it costs a dollar to get somebody a respirator. They're making their healthcare heroes wear dirty respirators because it's still legal. Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. No. Right now, millions of respirators are available. Any hospital can buy respirators and make their and allow their their healthcare heroes to wear a clean mask with every patient, which was the law before pan, the pandemic. In an emergency, then the government said you can wear them longer. And now they're being made law where made healthcare heroes are being made to wear masks multiple days to save money. Oh my gosh, like an emergency order because there weren't any masks because no one was listening to you for the past decade. And now they're just like, hey, we can use this to save even more money. It's it's mind boggling. Welcome to my world. This has been my life for 13 years and I, I, I would say things to myself and my wife like you just said all the time. This makes no sense. It's surreal. It's mind-boggling. How can this be? Why aren't people seeing this? It's not a big problem. In fact, I could I could send you 500 emails right now. I could go through my emails and send you 500 emails where, that I sent to politicians and people in government where I said, this doesn't cost money. <laughs> this, I'm not asking you for money. I'm not asking you for orders. I'm asking you to acknowledge the damn problem. And get on board. Say that this is a national security issue. And then I, I finally said, as, as the last few years, I'm thinking, okay, people aren't doing it out of responsibility. How about fear? So then I started saying to hospitals, you're going to get sued. I'm out there making a lot of a lot of noise. I'm on the news. This is a problem. The government acknowledges this problem. And you're, you've got your hands over your eyes and your ears. If people die and it's determined that you – could have prevented this. You could have given them proper PPE, but you didn't because you're saving money. You're in trouble. So, and I, I kept telling the, well, the last few years, I've been telling the government that. Okay, guys, if you don't want to spend money, let's just scare them <laughs> into it. You know, if they're not going to do it out of corporate or, or to be a good corporate citizen or, or to be moral, let's let's get the attorneys involved. Uh, because think about it. If a hospital administrator is told by the government, not by Mike Bowen, mask salesman, told by the government, your mask supply is going to collapse, you're not going to be able to protect your employees, uh, you're pretty, you're kind of liable for protecting your employees, just letting you know. You would think that the hospital's attorney goes, hey, maybe we ought to spend that $6,000 and buy, buy American-made masks so we don't get our asses sued off when we can't protect our employees. But no, I couldn't even get, uh, I couldn't even get people to do that. Now, one other thing, too. It's really scary. It's like the boy who, the, kind of like the boy who cried wolf story. We've had SARS, we've had Ebola, we've had H1N1, we've had COVID. None of them has. It, we don't see people, dead people, lying in the streets. It's not like the Contagion movie or the Outbreak movie. It's not scary. It's not scary enough. And I think that those four or five events are what people think a pandemic is. So when the big one does come, it's going to hit us like a freight train because people don't, they don't get it. They don't realize that there is the possibility that where two out of 10 people die instead of two out of 100, you know, three out of 10 die. H5, I think H5N1, uh, the one of the bird flus, it's like has a 50% kill rate. So we're, we're playing games here and, 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 uh, you know, and politics involved and, and uh, that mess with our previous president dismissing everything. We, we have this unreal view of, of, of what we're dealing with here. And now we've got people not getting vaccinated. Uh, we've got the Delta variant, which uh, uh, is bad, but another variant could come out that's, that's incubated in these non-vaxxers or, the, or, or, or Africa. Africa has 1.2 billion people. 1% are vaccinated. Which leads me to think, folks, we're not at the end of this thing. I think we're in the eye of the storm. I really do. I, I think we're in this calm period in the middle of the hurricane. And because of the anti-vaxxers and because of variants and things popping up, uh, I don't know. I, I'm really worried about the future. So 
has the attitude of hospitals or the government shifted in the middle of the pandemic? Uh, hospitals, a little. Some are going to buy American. Some are going to buy some American. Some will keep doing what they're doing. The government uh, isn't going to buy any more respirators, isn't going to um, stop China from sending masks here. I'm seeing it pretty at a pretty close range um, because of what I do and how much I've been in the news. They they call me, they talk to me. I'm seeing a lot of things that worry me. Um, it's like it, it's like it's like giving a team of people a really important task, but they all have handcuffs on. There's, there's certain things they can't do, and certain things they can't say, and. And and, and and they they rule they they work by committee instead of somebody that's decisive and smart and wise that just says okay here's what we need to do do you agree do you agree let's go it's just all this committee speak um, and it doesn't give me confidence that when we come out of this we're going to have a, anything safer than what we have right now well you know Mike they can study the problem <laughs> they can yeah they can yeah. Study. Yeah, they're good at that. By the way, let me uh, let me say something too. Um, in 2006, President Bush put out his Presidential Directive 21, which was to have the government look at the pandemic plans that they had and make adjustments if there were uh, gaps. Because uh, Katrina didn't go so well for him, so he put this out, and that's why HHS came to see us in 2007, in November 2007. And I can send you the presentation. I have a presentation from HHS that said the mass supply is going to fail. Yeah, in 2007. And uh, and I can tell you this, too, and I said this during my uh, my testimony before Congress. Robin Robinson, Richard Hatchett, and Rick Bright, they would all three fix the problem had they had authority. And Rick Bright at the end... Um, you know, in my testimony, a lot was a lot was made of my what I call my deep um, email. I sent uh, in, in January of 2020, I sent Rick Bright an email said we're in deep. Shit. The mass supply is going to fail, and, and then he sent it up the ladder. And nobody did anything, and then that ended up in the whistleblower thing. But that's what that was all about. So, so after the swine flu, uh, the national strategic talk pot, stockpile was depleted. It was never topped up. Uh, after the coronavirus pandemic has has that been topped up this time? Does that even matter if it is? Yeah, they they put some in, and there's there's an RFI out now, which I just submitted. They're going to buy 127 million more earloop masks, uh, which I and a bunch of other people are going to going to bid on. But uh, wait, sorry, you said 127 million? That's almost nothing. I mean, there's if there's 320 million Americans then this is going to last a third of Americans one day. Yeah, now they have some already. I don't know how much, but um, I think their thinking is it's just for health care. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody's working on a plan to make sure all Americans have masks. And I could be wrong, but I haven't seen anything like that. Is, um, there, is there a quality concern with the masks coming from China and Mexico? Um, because I know there's been some issues with counterfeit masks coming in, um, like fake N95 that aren't actually certified for that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Um, there was a, a whole whole bunch of fraud. I was working with the FBI. I was being impersonated. We have a really good reputation, and I'm kind of all over the news. So people were were impersonating me and trying to get people to send them money. In fact, uh, one woman called me one day and said, I'm about to uh, wire you $1.6 million. I'm just checking to make sure this is all legit. And I said, it's not me. Oh, my God. Uh, wow. we, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody in India copied our whole website and, and had uh, – they, they changed one letter in the word – our address was prestigeameritech.com. They changed one letter and made their own website, and it was – all of our stuff. Wow. Hey, I know how we can fund this show. Oh, God. <laughs> there was a whole lot of, there was a whole lot of fraud, a whole lot of fraud. Right now, though, uh, I mean, for months, I've been hearing crickets. It's, nobody's calling, nobody wants masks. Yeah, I was wondering, going back to what you said about California buying these N95s from China for $3 each and you're selling them for 79 cents. It just seems insane. But, 
Yeah. Well, the, the government's very good at spending enormous sums of money when it's politically expedient. Well, I heard somebody call it the money fan. I'd never heard that uh, before, but somebody who dealt with the government uh, said, uh, yeah, if the money fan comes on, he said it's crazy. But uh, yeah, now we haven't seen much of the money fan. We got a small, we got a small uh, FEMA contract. But what's ironic is the people who caused the problems are the ones benefiting. The people who left the country, all the big manufacturers, they're benefiting and getting big government contracts and uh, they caused the problem. They left America. They caused the problem. I warned everybody for 13 years, tried to get them to come back. They didn't come back. My predictions came true. They got rewarded. It's a little bit like a fireman who is an arsonist, goes and sets a fire and then gets a medal for putting out the fire. It, it, oh, it's God. like a, like that Ray Bradbury book, Fahrenheit 451, right? Where the firemen actually set the fires. Well, that's and different because they're not different. really rescuing people. But, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but, I mean, but, yeah. I, well, I was thinking about 3M, right? Because they essentially got their operations in China essentially got nationalized. By the Chinese government. By the Chinese government because they weren't allowing any manufacturers to ship out of the country. So they didn't learn their lesson. No. And then here's another thing that happened, too, is... Uh, when China, first of all, China cut us off. And then when they got the problem fixed, they flooded us with respirators and masks at ridiculously high prices because we couldn't get them. America, when I say America. So China is selling respirators to Gavin Newsom for $3 a piece that, they, that probably cost them 30 cents to make. And uh, yeah, yeah, uh, morally, that's some pretty bad stuff going on that way. Not to mention they were able to use that leverage to encourage the U.S. government to not look into the origin of the coronavirus too much. Yeah, I don't know anything about all that, uh, you know, where it came from or whatever, but it's, you know, it's here. It's a mess. It's going to be a mess for a long time. Now it's affecting young people. And uh, a lot of the, a lot of Americans think it's a hoax. I heard somebody got a blood clot, so I'm not going to get the vaccine. And, I, and what I say is, yeah, but it's like the guy who says, my uncle, if he'd have been wearing a seatbelt and hadn't been thrown free, he'd have died. So that's why I don't wear seatbelts. I mean, you know what? I, I call it the dumbass apocalypse. I have never seen more stupidity in my entire life. I mean, we all grew up getting vaccines and you, you get your measles vaccine and your polio vaccine and and these things work and they save lives. And now we've got people, we've got states having secret vaccinations so people won't be embarrassed to go get vaccinated. You're beginning to remind me of Red Foreman a bit now. Yeah. Wait. <sighs> yeah. Well, the, the, the crazy thing about this is it isn't a partisan failing. Like you've been talking to the Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, now the Biden administration. Yeah. And it was like, it's like Cassandra, the Greek myth. I'm going to educate the audience about Greek mythology. She could see the future, but she couldn't get anyone to believe her. And then there was the Trojan War. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Congressman uh, Sarbanes uh, brought that up. And uh, he said, you're Cassandra. Uh, and so did uh, Marin McKenna. Now, here's somebody else you need to interview. You need to interview Marin McKenna. She is the author of the book Superbug. And she's a journalist. She's written for Wired magazine. She and I um, have been talking about this for four years. She did a she did an article on me several years ago, and, and we kind of became colleagues or friends. Yeah, she's a pretty interesting person. But she said she she said, "Yeah, you're like Cassandra. Uh, you tell the truth, and nobody nobody believes it." Oh, oh boy. gosh! How did how did Prestige Ameritech survive all these years? Uh Innovation and stubbornness. Stubbornness. We. Uh, you don't strike uh, me as a stubborn person. Really. <laughs> <laughs> we. We just. We had nothing else to. I mean, it was it. We had all, everything we owned. It was invested into this, and and we had a really good reputation. We used to make eighty-seven percent of the mask supply. Our building used to make eighty-seven percent of the mask supply. We worked for a company called Technol, T E C N O L, back in the eighties and nineties. And Technol had 87% market share when Kimberly Clark bought it in 1997. Several years later, Kimberly Clark moved it to Mexico. And that same year, 
all of its competitors moved away. That's when we, and then a year or two later, we said, hey, this is a national security problem. Let's fix this. So we've been making masks for, <laughs> I call my business partner, Dan, uh, the last Jedi. This guy has forgotten more mask making. Um, he's forgotten more about masks than most experts know. You know. He's been making masks literally since the early 70s when he was 16 years old. Wow. Uh, so I guess the question is, what can anyone listening do? I mean, screaming into the void for decades sounds great. But <laughs> what, what can we do? I, just individual Americans? Yeah. I, I don't have good news. I mean, yeah, I could say write your congressman and then 100 people are going to do that and it's not going to help. Um, I don't think there's anything they can do. I, I just don't. I mean, it's depressing. I'm, it's depressing. So then I guess the question is, what can we as individuals do to prepare ourselves for the inevitable really bad pandemic that's coming? Um, practice defensive driving. I mean, you, you know, if, if everybody else is going to be a crazy driver, you don't have to be. So, um, and again, here I am, a mask salesman saying buy masks. So that's, it always looks like I'm trying to make money, but I'm not. We don't even sell to the public, hardly at all. We have a community service amount of masks that we sell and if you go to our website it's even hard to find and they're really expensive because we don't want to sell one because we're not set up to sell one box at a time we're set up to sell truckloads everybody ought to have some masks uh and, and you know as well it's like the government says you ought to have you ought to be able to survive for a couple of weeks with food and water and all that stuff put masks in your in your emergency kit and buy them from somebody else so you don't so it don't look like i'm trying to sell you but um yeah, uh, I, I think everybody just needs to to realize that we're in a new era, uh, with global with global transportation systems like they are. Anything that breaks out anywhere is going to be everywhere, and, uh, and and when it happens, you can't buy masks; they're all gone, or they're or they're ten dollars a piece. You know, a product that oh, I'll give you one. Ten years ago was the last time the government bought from us. They never bought from us. Couldn't get them to buy from us. They're buying Mexican-made masks because they were cheaper. And um, they bought about 4 million masks 10 years ago. Didn't use them. Put them in warehouses. And about two years ago, they auctioned them off. And some knucklehead, whoever bought them, then when the pandemic started, they started selling them on eBay for 10 times the price and started selling them on Amazon. And listing Prestige Ameritech, new Prestige Ameritech masks. So uh, protect yourself from COVID. First of all, the masks are 10 years old. They weren't made for COVID. We have no idea how they've been stored for 10 years. We don't have any idea if they're any good anymore. And I've got, I bet I had a thousand people call me. What's the expiration date? Are these masks good for COVID? Blah, 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 blah. On masks that I sold the government 10 years ago and the government sold to some knucklehead probably for nothing. Wow. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> again, it's, it's, it's surreal. This whole thing was surreal. And we've learned nothing. Um, you know, who was it that said uh, one thing people have learned from history is that we don't learn from history? <laughs> um, Very true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it wasn't even that long ago. What wasn't long ago? I mean, I mean, I was just thinking about swine flu. It wasn't that long ago, but also we're still in the middle of the thing right now. Yeah. We're still yeah. in the middle right. of COVID, yeah. and we haven't learned from COVID enough to buy American masks, or even that the, this this is warfare. The Chinese Communist Party is using this as a form of warfare. Yeah, but we can save buy masks for eight thousand dollars, six thousand dollars. Unrealistic or predatory Chinese pricing is the world's biggest Trojan horse because it's decimated our manufacturing ability uh, of the world because everybody goes to China for these products. Um, we won World War II because of our manufacturing. We turned you know, factories that were making toasters into making hand grenades. Well, there are, no, there are any toaster manufacturers anymore. There, uh, all of our manufacturing is now in China. So, you know, Turning a Starbucks, having a Starbucks makes bullets, make bullets doesn't work. 
<laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're yeah, we're going to be in trouble. China, China is in a very powerful, very scary position with the United States when it comes to medicine, when it comes to manufacturing anything. And I've said to people who say, "Well, I'm buying it from China because it costs less." And I said, "Well, okay, look around you, look out your window. Everything that you can see that is made by a human can be made and sold." way less in china so we just do we just have them make everything we have them completely control everything we're we're doing do we just give up the reins of the united states to china because of everyday low prices yes we do that's what we're doing as a nation that's a great slogan everyday low prices <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i think this is something people think that like if there is an emergency like World War II. Oh, we'll just start back up American manufacturing. We'll just flip a switch and we'll get back. No. no. Yeah, the old flip a switch. Uh, no. Well, why Why doesn't that work? Knowledge. The people who used to make those products are, they're gone. I mean, they, you know, you, you, you lose. When you quit making something, you forget how to make it. And you can't just go back and start making things like that. And uh, you, you, the government has an opera, has a word. Of, yeah, have you heard of the term warm, W-A-R-M, warm base? They no. call it a warm base when, when you have, like, if they say, hey, Mike, we want you to have 10 respirator lines just ready to go at any time. Well, that's a warm base. And they do that because they know that, it, or if they do it, it's because they know that we can't get this fast unless it's a warm base, unless somebody's there either already making this stuff or set up to make it. Starting from ground zero and, and trying to make things, uh, you know, you can't just start up and make jets or guns or whatever. You have to have those things that are close, at least people who work with metal and things. And all those people are, are still leaving. And what's interesting is if you go to a, like go to the National Hardware Show in Las Vegas, there will be a whole corner of the exhibition. There's nothing but Chinese companies um, trying to replace American-made products, um, you know, lawnmowers, whatever. Um, and uh, the, the, the addiction, the uh, attraction to making more – It's again, let me just keep saying that it's all about the money. It's all about profit. It's all about greed. Uh, and China has figured that out. They go, hey, all we got to do is have low prices and we're going to own America. We can buy America, buy America with these low prices. We'll make all of their products. We'll make all of their drugs. We'll own them. They can't start a war with us. We'll just cut off the medical supply. So, and uh, I don't know what it, I don't know what all is controlled, but I have a feeling it's probably too much. And I don't know if we've gone past the, uh, the point of no return, but um, I think if we haven't, we're close. You know, speaking from like a mask manufacturing perspective, I mean, how long would it take to start making like, like, let's say you didn't have a warm base. Is it even possible to start manufacturing, you know, masks if there's a like, huge demand? Yeah, uh, a, a bunch of companies did that. Um, you know, within six months or so, you can be making more masks. But all of these companies are going to go out of business. My company is going to suffer. We already suffered 10 years ago doing this and almost went out of business. The next time the boy cries wolf, the village people ain't coming. Um, we've gotten hurt too badly. The, the mask makers... Um, have gotten hurt too badly and they're going to continue to get hurt. So I just don't know if anybody would, would want to do this again. Cause right now we're at right now we've got, we've got six respirator lines that are sitting there not running. Um, uh, we have 150 less people than we did um, six months ago and uh, sales are going down and we have contracts. One thing we did, that we didn't do last time. We were really gullible last time. And uh, hospitals were desperate. They were calling us. Can you help us? We can't get masks anywhere else. I understand you have masks. And I, I say, yeah, folks, but you got to stay with us. We're building a factory. We're hiring people. We're building machines. you got to stay with us. Gullible, naive Texans. And uh, 
And we and they said we will, and they didn't, and we almost went out of business. This time we were a little bit smarter and said you got to sign a two-year contract. But then uh, what happens when that contract um, goes gets over? You know, there's probably going to be a period of uh, glut, and uh, then also as these mask makers are dying, um, the new mask makers, as they're dying, they're going to be giving away masks for anything just to recoup some of their money. So it's going to be painful when this ends. I don't think anybody's going to want to do this again. Gear up. Gear up again. Without assurances. Also, if you go back and look at my testimony from last May, I got in an argument with uh, Buddy Carter, a uh, congressman from Georgia, who kept saying, just gear up, you know, be an American, be a patriot. And I'm going, I did that before. I saw that movie. It doesn't end well. Um, we, we geared up and almost got killed. Give me some assurances. Give me a contract, and I'll gear up. And um, and, and I was getting hassled for that during that meeting. And, and now people are realizing, oh, okay, yeah, he was right. All these people who did gear up and built all these machines and factories, they're all going to go out of business. Well, most of them are going to go bankrupt. All right. Uh, well... I just uh, hope our uh, nuclear weapon supply is not in the same state. Hey, yeah, that's the bright side. Maybe it'll just be like a quick nuclear war and we won't have to deal with a horrible <laughs> pandemic. There's <laughs> uh, the silver yeah. lining of the nuclear cloud. Yeah, there, there you go. So, yeah. so Mike, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep are you going to keep uh, warning everybody? Well, right now I'm pounding on the government to uh, to do more to keep to level the playing field. Here's what I'm telling the government. If you, again, I'm not asking for orders. I'm not asking for business. What I'm saying to the government is level the playing field. Keep these cheap imported products out. That will expand the market by 20 times. Think about this. Before the pandemic, 95% of the market was imported. Make that go away. That means the market is now 20 times bigger. So some of these new mask makers can survive. They're all going, they're going out of business now. Several of them already have. They're, they're, you can't keep a business going when, you're not, when you don't have any sales. You can't do that very long. So these guys are going out of business. I, and hopefully the government will do that. And I keep doing that. Um, I, I do every interview that I can to try to get the word out, to try to keep this issue going, because I know what's going to happen. Let's just say it ended today and nobody's nobody needs masks and the pandemic's over. It's old news. Now we're talking about some other news. Nobody's talking about fixing the mask supply. So while people are still worried about it, I'm going to keep on squawking. We need to completely decouple with China. That solves everything. Most things. The government will still be stupid. <laughs> it just, you know, you know. We, one thing I found is that uh, words are cheap. It's easy to call a healthcare worker a hero. That doesn't cost anything. It's easy to say, "Oh yeah, I support American products." I, 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 uh, yeah, absolutely. People ought to buy American. And then, the, then you go, then they go to the Home Depot, and the U.S. made drill is fifty nine dollars. The Chinese made drill is twenty nine dollars. And there, with nobody looking, they buy the Chinese drill. Um, and that's the way it goes. It's, it's the lure of low prices. Uh, Sam Walton figured that out 40 years ago. The Chinese figured that out. All we got to do, hey, folks, I can picture him in a meeting 20 years ago. Hey, all we've got to do is offer re stupid low prices. They're going to become totally dependent on us. Sure, it'll cost us a trillion dollars to do it, but we're going to be in control. We control the world. And that seems to be what's happening. It's not uh, people aren't going to China because they have the best products. Most of their products aren't that good. They're going to save money. And it's Americans trying to save money may be the death of us. Very literally. I also think there's a huge problem with not even being able to find things that aren't made in China. Or, yeah, I was looking the, for a oh, tea kettle. I could not find a tea kettle that was oh, not made, made in USA. In yeah, yeah you USA. said made in China. You meant made in the USA. Yeah, about five years ago, um, when I was uh, probably extra pissed off one day about this whole issue, I I had to buy 
11 items from Lowe's uh, Home Improvement Center. On a Saturday, I went to Lowe's. I said to myself, I'm going to buy American. I don't care what it costs. I'm, I'm going to search out and find American products. I bought one product, a plunger, a <laughs> toilet plunger. The rest of them, they're, everything was China. So we're still in the fight. With American plungers, we can turn back the tide. There you go, man. Let's, uh, the, the, plunger, the plunger factory guys can now make tanks, right, in a war. Yes. Um, here, here's what, uh, I'm glad you brought this up because here's where it happened. It wasn't the American consumers who did this. Well, directly. What happened is the Lowe's people, the Walmart people, the Home Depot people said, hey, if we sell our own brand – and it's made in China. We can make way more money. So let's sell Rigid instead of Black & Decker. Let's sell Cobalt instead of DeWalt. And go, go into a Home Depot. Uh, and that's what they're doing. So DeWalt's over here. You know, it's a little section. And, it, and then do their brands are really big. So it's they have taken the choice away from American consumers. They've taken the choice away by switching. And, and the hospitals did the same. Sorry. The uh, the medical manufacturers who make masks did the same thing. They didn't make a big announcement. Hey, folks. Hey, American hospitals. We're switching. We're going to start making our products in China now. No, no, no. Boxes look the same. Except instead of South Dakota or Warrendale, Pennsylvania or Fort Worth, Texas, um, the products were now coming from China. So they could save money. About the money. Greed. What, who was it uh, in Wall Street? What's his face? Uh, Michael oh, Douglas. Greed, said, greed is good. Gordon greed Gecko. is good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, greed is good. No, no, greed is uh, not good. Yeah, and, and this I is... mean, it's funny people like use that slogan "greed is good" as if it's a positive thing. But the whole point is he was the villain of that movie, right? I don't think people treated him as the villain of yeah. that movie. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you make capitalism works, but it definitely needs to be uh, <laughs> regulated, and monitored. Um, because, you know, the greed, people are by nature greedy. It certainly doesn't work when you have, like, aggressive communist uh, regimes with total control over their economy trying to undermine our systems. Yeah. And, and I think the other point you, you brought up, Mike, which is a good one, is that, like, a lot of these decisions are not being made uh, by individuals. They're being made behind closed doors by corporations. And if there was some way that like there was enough light shining on the issue that like when whoever, whether it's a corporation or an individual who's making, they've got a choice between American and Chinese when they're buying something. And that that choice, everyone has to make that out in the open. And especially corporations, if they have to make that a public and fully transparent, then they're going to be a lot less likely to make the decision to buy from China when the American one is only a little bit more expensive and uh, everyone else can see that they're making that decision. But it's it's now, it's completely opaque, except for, you know, the occasional Cassandra screaming in the wind. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's a problem that can be fixed. You know, not every problem can be fixed. And uh, have we passed a point of no return? I know that people don't just buy out of patriotism. Uh, people people make decisions based on their personal situations. And normally, like I said, Sam Walton figured out that if I'm the cheapest, I'm going to get the business. And uh, the medical manufacturers have gone as well. Oh, here's another thing, too, is when one guy, when I say guy, I was born a long time ago, sorry. When one person decides to take, let's just say it's socks. Everybody's making their socks in North Carolina. And uh, one person decides to start making their socks in China. Well, they start killing everybody else. Everybody else goes to China. So the result is that person had a temporary advantage. That advantage went away when defensively all of their competitors went to China. Now they're all making less money. The products aren't as good. And they laid off 10,000 people. Yeah. And then when we enter a sock war with China, we're completely screwed. None of us have any socks, so we have to wrap our feet in cloth like like Russian soldiers, you know? I mean, you joke, but <laughs> textiles are important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 
another thing too, you think about this. My products, masks, are highly automated. They're not made by hand. They're highly automated. So hospitals weren't satisfied that masks were cheap enough by being automated and that we didn't have people hand making them. They wanted to further save money by going to China where people make a dollar an hour instead of $12 an hour here and save that extra money from the people running the machines and taking the products off the end of the line. Um, so it, it, it's, um, yeah, I just keep going back to the thing, trying to saving money is killing us. And it's at a certain point, the prices from China are going to go up. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and think about this, the people who used to go down to the Amana refrigerator factory and make a pretty good living, that factory doesn't exist anymore. And Starbucks doesn't pay that well. Now, I mean, these people, the middle class, the people... The people who didn't go to high school but are hard workers and they're smart and they need a good job, those people are the ones who are getting killed by the Walmarts and, and Lowe's and Home Depot um, taking everything to China. Because these folks who used to work and make refrigerators and bicycles and TVs and things, those jobs don't exist anymore. It's either work at McDonald's or be college educated and, and, and have a – you know, a job that these people cannot get now. So now you've got them saying, hey, McDonald's, we need 15 or we need we need to be paid a lot more because we can't live on what you pay. And McDonald's isn't saying this, but what they ought to be saying is, gee, we started this company based on 16 year olds having their first job, not adults trying to feed their family. You know, so. The, the death of American manufacturing is just slaughtering the middle class, and it's getting worse. I mean, it's not stopped. The line to go to China and make products is still a long line and pretty wide, too. So, and again, I'm just a mask maker. I mean, I see this little part of it, but the whole thing does bother me. Yeah, really, the story you're saying is echoed throughout American society in its yeah. – it's the same story. We have to decouple from China, the Chinese Communist Party. Well, let me say this. Every single day of the last – since since the pandemic started, every single day I've gotten emails from Chinese manufacturers wanting to sell me materials and machines or make my products. And I'll bet you there's probably 100 new mass companies in the USA last year. There were like five when we started – so those hundred are going to die, but there's probably 500 new mass companies in China. So things are way, way worse. After the pandemic, there's going to be so many mask makers out there in China flooding the U.S. with very attractive pricing that a lot of people are going to not be able to resist. And what I keep telling these people is, listen, just pretend it doesn't exist. I mean, it's like it's not real. They're not making money, and, and you're hurting our country but they can't do that. They, it's the the uh, the allure of low prices is again, it's like a crack cocaine habit. So not only did we not learn our lesson from the coronavirus pandemic, things are actually going to be worse. Is what you're saying? It, it could be worse. This all relies on the government. Right now, if the government doesn't level the playing field, we're screwed. Decouple from China. All right. Mike, that was awful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Well, uh, I'm one of those people that if you ask me a straight question, I'm going to give you a straight answer. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, I mean, yeah. this, is, this is what we want to hear. We need to know. <laughs> I imagine we're all equally fun at parties. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, so Mike, thanks for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Well, that was a fun, lighthearted episode. You know, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know how bad it was. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, what we could do about it is commission a study. <laughs> Ooh, study the problem. That's, yeah. that's let's, great. Let's study the problem, yeah. Yeah, it was interesting when he was talking about how, you know, there were some people at a certain level of the some government people. who... No, 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 that, that wanted to help, right? But then they were like, my hands are tied. I can't actually authorize buying masks or something like that, you know? 
uh, yeah, just the levels of bureaucracy. It's it's insane. Well, the, the best way to solve this is by giving the federal government more money because that will free them from bureaucracy, right? I They'll have lots of money to study the problem. Oh, man. I mean, when he was talking about all of these mask manufacturers, these new American mask manufacturers that are all going to go out of business. So I bought some American made surgical masks from one of these new companies. Mm -hmm. And um, they've been doing a lot of sales lately, like 30 percent off masks. Oh, that kind of sale. Yeah. Cheap it. Like cheap. Well, because I think they're essentially... I saw an interview with the CEO of this company who said they can last maybe another four months without any help from the government. Well, that's what Mike Bowen was saying. That like, so they're all going to have to just, they're going to sell it for pennies just to recoup any kind of money. And that's going to distort the market. And then also the Chinese mask manufacturers. Yeah, I remember hearing some people... Uh, talking about how they were just getting random emails from Chinese companies in the like after they stopped restricting the mask supply, suddenly there was a flood of new Chinese mask manufacturers who were just emailing random people with China connections and offering to send the masks or sell the masks. Mm-hmm. So it was just this sudden surge of Chinese mask companies. What upsets me is like, like, how do you not see this pattern? Like China undercuts the market and and we're like, oh, cheap masks. And then China completely cuts off the supply and we're like, oh, no, we can't get any masks. And then China sells them to us and we're paying three dollars a mask when we could get it at a quarter of the price or or even far less from Americans. Uh but we pay it anyway. Well, and then China comes back now that there's a glut of American stuff on the market and China's again undercutting the prices. And we're like, ooh, cheap masks. Well, I think one thing that got lost in that is, you know, Mike Bowen's company was selling masks for 79 cents where China Chinese manufacturers were selling them to, to Newsom for $3. But Mike Bowen could not, like he wasn't able to supply all of California. You know what I mean? Right, because- they didn't have the capacity built up. And because... then it takes six months to ramp up your capacity. Yeah. And then it's like, too late. Six and then you months have in a pandemic? Up. Like, you have to have American, what do you say, warm base, right? Yeah. Like you have warm bases. Well, I mean, that's the other thing that a lot of these, the machinery gets sold off to other countries. Like the, you know, It's just like this, this whole domino effect of... These like the manufacturing getting completely gutted in the U.S. And you can see how like if something really bad hits, it could just cause a complete collapse of American society. I mean, this is not as bad as the PPE or the medical like medicine and that kind of stuff. But right now we're in the middle of this huge shortage of all sorts of stuff, right? Because of these supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that Chinese ports are totally backlog. Well, and now they're kind of backlogging American ports. So yeah, like the, the, the port of Oakland in California is like, there's, you know, several weeks wait once the ship is there in the bay before it can actually dock at a port and unload. Like, that's insane. Yeah, and I think I'm reading that it's really only going to get worse from here, that we haven't really seen uh, the, this is not the, the worst part of the shortage that it's going to get worse and it could last, you know, another year. Oh, good. Or, good. Or, or more, eh, you know. And, and and the crazy thing is like all the shortages we're seeing with like the shipping containers that are causing this other domino effect. It's like it could have been avoided if we just made most stuff in America. And I think an important thing that Mike Bowen brought up is this is not just like Part of it is American consumers making a choice. But a lot of things happen behind the scenes that we have no control over. Like when China uh, sells vitamins for pennies on the pound or whatever, like below market value. And like Kellogg's will buy vats of Chinese vitamins to fortify their cereals. Like that's not something any consumer really knows about or even thinks about. Right. Or has any control over. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, it doesn't like that is not something that can be solved by, oh, I'll buy another cereal brand because they're all doing it. Yeah, I was at, at Home Depot. I wanted to buy a new toolkit and uh, I actually had a, a sales rep at Home Depot help me. And I and I said to him, uh, 
help me get everything I possibly can made in America. Uh, and he's like, it's going to be more expensive. I'm like, I, I don't care. Like, see what you can do. And every single thing that there was an option for, I got made in America. And I could still only get less than half. And it was it was insane. I mean, that's shocking. I always thought it was Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when he was talking, Mike was talking about Bridget being a, 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 I didn't realize that was Home Depot's you know, in-store brand. Yeah, that was, they that was a off good take. China. Yeah, the, it's just, it's so frustrating because I am really on a kick lately of trying to buy everything I can made in America and just searching through, because often you can't really tell where certain things are made. Like Mike was talking about how it'd be like manufactured in the U.S. or whatever, but assembled. like really, yeah, assembled. Yeah, that's, that's very misleading. But uh, yeah, and then I remember looking at sheets, trying to find sheets made in America. And there's one company that makes uh, American sheets made from cotton grown in America. Because that's another thing, right? Where's the Most cotton Most cotton from? comes from Xinjiang and slave labor. Uh, so then they were talking about how you could buy towels made out of their cotton made in the only factory left in the United States that could make towels. And you just think about like there's one factory in Georgia that can still make just like normal terry cloth towels, right? It just don't forget to bring a towel. What? what there we go. Yeah. yeah. Shelly, weren't you telling me about one city in China that makes all of the microwaves in the world for every it, company? It wasn't. Um, it was one factory in Guangzhou. One factory. Yeah. So I was looking at buying a new microwave, right? Just a normal countertop microwave. And uh, I was looking at which are the best microwaves. And Wirecutter did a thing where they basically took apart a bunch of microwaves and discovered that inside they were all made by the same company called Medea, uh, M-I-D-E-A. And it is one factory in Guangzhou that seems to be manufacturing all of the cheap countertop microwaves for every brand, almost every brand. I think Panasonic was the one that they didn't do, but you know, basically, you could buy any branded microwave so, you want. So all these competing brands are actually made at the same Chinese factory. Yeah, I think that actually happens a lot where a Chinese factory will make multiple, uh, you know, will make the same product for a bunch of different brands and you might have higher or lower tier materials or whatever, but it's made at the same place. You know, they say without bitterness, we wouldn't know what sweetness is. If it's all bitter, you know, I'd like a little bit of sweetness in the mix. I mean, a little bit. <laughs> but that's why we have Shelly. Oh yeah, I'm I'm a ray of sunshine, ball of thermonuclear fusion spewing out radiation. Uh <sighs> I was going to talk about the difficulty of finding things made in America, which is Carry on. Which is a, a definitely really cheerful thing. So I try to back a Kickstarter campaign for a clock, this alarm clock that was, you know, advertised as they were going to make it all in America. And it was this, you know, analog oh, quality, you know, hand machine, whatever. It was supposed to be a great alarm clock. And th the music to wake you up was supposed to be backed by science and composed by a Grammy winning composer, whatever. It was a very expensive alarm clock. Uh, I backed it partly because it was going to be completely made in America. Mm -hmm. um, after they had collected all the pledges, then they sent an email to everyone going, well, actually, we couldn't find a, a manufacturer in America. And so we've decided to work with this great company uh, in China, which will definitely guarantee the same quality that we were going to get from American manufacturers. And we feel really good about this. And... A lot of people who backed it were upset and their comments were full of people being like, I backed this because it was going to be made in America. Well, I don't know why everyone was so upset because clearly that is the best wake up call. <laughs> <laughs> and then they defended themselves, you know, by saying that, well, you know, we really tried, but, you know, we were dealing with all of these. Uh, and to be fair to them, it was happening during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So they were like, we were, you know, we were dealing with a bunch of 
you know, shortages and people couldn't guarantee how long it would take them to get materials and all this stuff. And then when we added it up, it would cost us two hundred dollars each mm -hmm. to make this alarm. And clock. how much were they? Charging? They were selling it for two fifty. So and they were like, this is too expensive to make the alarm clock for two hundred. Uh, so we had to and then, you know, somebody introduced us to this great factory in China and they have great quality control and all the stuff. And they're like, we wanted to make it in America, but we just couldn't. Uh, so after it. they made this announcement, you were obviously upset. Did you did you like get your money back? Yeah, I had posted a comment saying that I was upset about it. And, you know, one of the reasons I try not to buy stuff from China is because of genocide uh, of the Uyghurs and different things and slave labor. And they refunded me and they refunded a bunch of people who complained. But also once we were refunded, then our comments were hidden. Oh. Because then it's like we, we're not backing it anymore. What's so that company again, Shelley? <laughs> uh, it was called One Clock. One Clock. Yeah. Remember that. Well, I mean, I think it's probably a little bit of a niche. Yeah, two hundred fifty dollar alarm clock. Yeah, right. By a rooster born and raised in America. Well, yeah. I mean, I was just and like, you can't eat it too. <laughs> can't eat the alarm clock. But it was just this. I mean, I did feel a little bit bad about for them when they explained the whole situation, where they were like, "Oh, like I could see that in a pandemic, it might have been." But again, the reason that we have all these shortages because of the pandemic is because we've hollowed out our manufacturing yeah. base in the U.S. And this is the thing: it's not going to get easier to wean ourselves off China as it goes along. It's only going to get harder. I mean, we've already, like Mike was saying, we've lost a lot of the knowledge. I mean, when a lot of these factories move to China, they they send their equipment over, you know, or they sell it off. Like the equipment to make the stuff is not in America anymore. You know who was right about this all along? Kissinger? No, the the leftists who were protesting America getting China to join the World Trade Organization. And the ones who were like, protect the American worker. Don't let China join the WTO. I and mean, that was the beginning of the end for American manufacturing and American wages. You still have people like Bernie Sanders, right? Um, Elizabeth Warren, uh, even Chuck Schumer. They're, they're protectionist on this one issue. But I don't know if they're actually doing anything about it besides commissioning studies or, you know, it's a it's a it's a good soundbite. Right. Like it's a good yeah. you can talk is cheap, but actually bringing manufacturing back is going to be a hard struggle. And you might have to strong arm some companies or, you know, get other ways to incentivize them like what Japan was doing. Speaking of talk being cheap. This episode is dedicated to all the frontline heroes and their <laughs> oh. great sacrifices that they have made in the name of American corporate greed. It's interesting also when he was talking about the people still reusing N95s. Uh -huh. You know, America, most Americans are using cloth masks, which are not that effective. And... Compared to surgical masks or N95s or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was one of those things where the messaging from, you know, the government was cloth masks because we didn't have enough surgical masks for mm -hmm. healthcare workers. And now there's a glut of masks. But, you know, people kind of just got used to wearing cloth masks. Well, this so is this is a danger that happens where temporary emergency measures become permanent. And I think that all of us have to be really vigilant that things that, you know, we did or that we agreed to temporarily under emergency circumstances over the last year and a half don't become like a permanent long term thing unless they're good. I mean, there are some good things that can come out of it. But like, you know, do we really want to give, for example, uh, to agree to letting governments impose Chinese style uh, restrictions during, you know, what because it's an emergency. Victoria and Australia just went on another lockdown. I mean, yeah, lockdown. I mean, that's Victoria, Australia is a whole other episode. And that's the state that has uh, Melbourne. Uh, and their, like, their premier, Daniel Andrews, is basically, he was the guy who, against the wishes of the Australian federal government, signed a Belt and Road deal with China 
And he's also the guy, he's also like, he's a premier, not a governor, but he's essentially the the most lockdown happy governor of like any place in the the free world uh, for a tiny number of cases they've put on unbelievable restrictions. And I'm only saying there's a correlation between that and his China deals, not necessarily causation, but you know, it's a, it's a scary thing. I mean, it's just because they're trying to go for eradication, right? But then how can you do that if you are in essentially the only countries that were able to go that route were initially island countries? Right. And then now even a lot of them are having trouble. Yeah. Uh, so it's it, it just the idea of being able to eradicate it in just one state in Australia and locking down every time until you do, it's, you're right. never going to be able to open back up. It, yeah. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of scientific sense, but- well, Matt's you point know. was about, you know, emergency powers becoming permanent. And, you know, Star Wars prequels, they really taught us a lot. Chancellor Palpatine, he I got emergency. Democracy. And he got emergency temporary powers, too, yeah. because there was a war. There, I mean, one thing the U.S. government could definitely do is to revoke some of those emergency use authorizations. That, mm -hmm. Like the one that Mike was talking about that allows... Um, you know, hospitals to tell their staff to just reuse masks. Over but and over now, again. since money is involved, I bet there'd be a huge protest from like people in the hospitals who are the ones making the money. I don't think we'd hear much from the healthcare workers themselves, but there's now people incentivized to fight something like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is just one sign of how the entire healthcare system is broken when costs uh, are disconnected from the people who pay them which are disconnected from the people who need the the healthcare or the people who give the healthcare. Like everything's so disconnected in that world that it's just like like an insane knot of things that cannot be untangled. I will say the FDA did just uh, revoke their emergency use, author use authorization for a lot of these N95 substitutes from China and other countries. The KN95? Yeah. So yeah. they're not, I mean, they can still sell them in the U.S. to consumers, but they won't be allowed to be used as a medical grade product used in hospitals. But what they could do is change one letter in the URL for prestige medical oh, gosh, and that, sell them. That was crazy. But when the what Mike was talking about with, and this goes back to your point about the healthcare system. The fact that all of these comp uh, all these hospitals basically are in giant group buying co-op things where, you know, hospital systems are already huge. And then the hospital systems all band together to buy things together. You say you w ha did have the administrator of one hospital who wanted to buy American made masks. Would he be able to do it? Yeah, the, the solution really is we need to decouple the U.S. and China economy. From our, on our terms. Yes. Yeah. Because eventually China will do that on their terms. Yeah. And we already talked about on the previous episode about how they're already starting to, Trying to do, that. do that. And yeah, it's it's I mean, once they can successfully do that, it's a sign that we've already it's it's gone too far. Yep. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not going to be an easy thing to bring manufacturing back to the U.S., it's going to be painful, but if we don't do it now before an emergency, it's only going to get more painful when we have to. And we're Americans. We can take the pain now. We can make the sacrifice. We can do it. As Winston Churchill said, Americans will always do the right thing after exhausting every other option. And with that... Thanks for watching this episode of China Unscripted. We are assembled in America, manufactured in China. Uh, <laughs> once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Talk to you next time.